start recording. Okay, so today uh, Lambda was asking about uh, tile sets and things. Um, so I've got kind of a, I made this annoyingly long list of things to touch on yesterday. Um, so we're going to talk about kind of designing tile sets and kind of why we have them and kind of a little bit of history. Uh, we're going to talk about why your art style actually matters a lot when designing tile sets and how it affects what you need to do implementation side uh, to get good results. Um, we're going to talk about different ways of handling borders between different um, quote unquote materials. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about storing tile maps. And we'll talk also a little bit about um, like doing programming relating to just having things on a grid and also doing tile maps uh, anyway. So let me jump to some, I've got a bunch of screenshots here <laughs> to talk about. Uh, so this is Dragon Warrior for the NES. And this is kind of the, I mean, next to ASCII art, uh, like Dwarf Fortress or something. This is kind of the most basic way that you can do a tile-based map. Um, so each type of terrain just has one image uh, and each tile is like a self-contained thing. Some of them connect like the bricks. Um, it's almost impossible to make a brick texture that doesn't connect um, because it has lots of nice straight lines in it. Um, and so kind of like by virtue of designing around that, you can kind of get like, it's not particularly attractive, but a lot of the ugliness of NES games is just like the color restrictions they had to deal with. Um, if they had more colors, this could still look quite lovely even by today's standards. Um, but so you notice the, the walls, there's just like one rock wall with some shadow on the left and the bottom, and that's just one single tile. But when you put them next to each other, you get these kind of borders um, and it looks uh, like something more structured than it actually is. Um, but yeah, these are all just single tiles per terrain type, um, which is kind of the most basic thing you can do. And also what I will often do is I will start out this way with a, like a debug tile set where I have one image per thing. And then later I will come in and replace it with a more detailed tile set with like little nuances and stuff in it. Um, so moving on from that, um, a similar example, we've got Pokemon Red here. Um, so Pokemon, uh, up until recent years, has always been very good about adding like small details um, to just add visual flair and polish. Um, so even back in these days, uh, like you'll notice, so this light, uh, this like shallow grass here, short grass, I guess would be the word, um, is one tile that repeats, uh, but they've put effort in to make sure that it looks nice when it's tiled. Um, but if you squint, you can kind of see there's like a circle of blades around just this big empty spot, which is a little bit difficult to unsee. Um, if your brain is like mine, you might enjoy the repetitiveness and simplicity of this art style. Um, it's very, uh, symmetrical is not the word, but I like how orderly it is, I guess I would say without everything being necessarily boxy. Um, and this kind of leads into a secondary thing, which is uh, the idea of subtiles. Um, so on systems like the NES and the Game Boy, the way that rendering works is called character set rendering. So the entire, the way that you draw is you fill the screen up with these eight pixel by eight pixel characters. Um, so, and you might say eight pixels, but this tree is 16 pixels and the characters are 16 pixels. And visually, most of the tiles in the game are actually 16 pixels and you would be correct, but they are all composed out of eight by eight pieces. So like, although the game's maps are storing one grass tile, that grass tile is represented on the screen with four identical of this little eight by eight, two blades of grass tile or character. Um, and things like that. So like this ledge tile is two short grass tiles and then two of this rock wall tile, things like that. Um, 
adds a little bit more complexity and gives you room to do sort of transitions. So you can transition um, from light grass to short grass and things like that. We have here like medium grass and then there's medium grass with flowers in um, and things of that nature. Humans do like patterns, uh, DMM. So there's kind of, you can do single objects, right? Where you've got one tile is its own discrete self-contained object. And then you kind of fill out the edges with whatever terrain you're placing it on so that it, like, you can compose it in a scene and it looks right. Um, the level up from this is to do something like Link's Awakening where we have a tree which is composed of four tiles, right? Um, Link's Awakening also goes uh, to another level, which there are lots of other games. I'm just using these because they're the examples I thought of. Um, Link's Awakening has a lot of transition tiles. Um, Link's Awakening, I don't believe, has layers. Um, Minish Cap does because it does things like um, tree branches that you can walk underneath and things of that sort. Um, you do see layers a lot um, with 2D tile maps. I would argue that you almost never need more than two layers, um, but there are situations where you want more and it's like easiest to implement if you just add more layers. Um, but so for more examples, uh, Link and most of the entities in the game are like 16 pixels, but they're composed out of these eight pixel pieces, um, which will come up when we talk about auto tiling in a little bit. Um, but so this uh, puffy grass has these really nice transition tiles uh, to the shallow water. Um, they're not specific to the shallow water, but it works because, of course, on Game Boy, you have four shades, um, you have four values and no hues. So um, it was very easy to get these nice transitions that are really versatile, no pun intended. So you can have these grass transitions work with shallow water or shallow grass or stone or dirt or any other material because you're only working with four colors. Um, so as long as the contrast isn't wonky, you're in good shape. Um, and there are other edge tiles you can see like here on the edge of the mountain, you've got this kind of corner tile, which is physically just as square as the other tiles, but visually it's a corner, um, which is nice. Uh, what's my next quote unquote slide? So I wanted to briefly mention Link's Awakening DX, um, the color version for Game Boy Color. Um, this game still looks really nice in my opinion, but you can definitely see kind of the growing pains of taking a bunch of artwork made for the Game Boy and then just kind of adding color um, semi-appropriately. The way that palettes work on the Game Boy Color, you can only have like three colors per character. Um, and of course there was a lot of limited space. So these are the same tile sets as before, just colored um, in somewhat limited fashion. So now there's this really harsh transition between the puffy grass and the shallow water because the shallow water has this bright blue color and it makes an ugly seam, right? And before, you know, the trees would have, uh, they would just kind of fade into the surrounding terrain, um, but now it's this bright yellow and so you get these harsh borders. Um, it's worth noting that this stuff is less visible on hardware um, just because it's not a backlit screen and it's quite small and the colors are a little bit washed out, um, but it still matters in terms of like an artistic concern. Um, and definitely if you're running in an emulator or on like a modded Game Boy or something, also a thing. Um, but so something else, this is very scattered and I apologize to any current or future watchers, but so in situations where there were or could only be one layer of tiles, it was typical to see it sort of, you would pick kind of your base terrain, which here is this light yellow, and then you would kind of like orchestrate everything else to kind of use that as a base color. And so everything else is either sort of above or below that. Um, so the signs have a shadow and stuff that puts them on that bright yellow ground color. So do the trees, so does the puffy grass, so does, so do most things like this weird statue thing, which is a donut for some reason, never understood that. Um, and the UI is also that bright yellow color to make it unobtrusive, but, um, with 
when you have layers, then you don't have to do this. You can have sort of terrain tiles underneath for different types of ground, and you can have object tiles for grass and signs and things that have transparency. Um, this doesn't really matter in 3D, obviously, because you can just have whatever you want in 3D. Um, let's see. Here's another way of doing things, um, which is sort of an extreme version of, it's sort of an extreme version of having a base tile color. Um, and this, we have a very sparse tile set. So in actuality, you wouldn't even need to have this like base color tile. You could just fill the screen, right, with this base color, which is the quote unquote ground. And then these other things like patches, like these are, you know, this suggests that there's some like rocks or gravel here, or maybe it's grass. Um, and these are kind of just little accoutrements that you can kind of tack on. Um, so you have a base terrain, which is just this flat color, and then you add these little decorative elements um, to give the impression of more detail, right? This is kind of, I don't know, you could liken this to the pixel art equivalent of cell shading, um, but the term cell shading has lost some of its meaning because people have disdain for it now. Um, but anyway, so jumping kind of far ahead to much more complex pixel art, here's some Chrono Trigger. So Chrono Trigger is a SNES game. It's tile-based. Uh, pet peeve, pretty much every game is tile-based, but even 3D games are tile-based in some respects. But anyway, but the artist for Chrono Trigger has gone to a lot of effort to hide the tile boundaries from you. Um, you can, of course, see them in some places. Um, on an actual CRT, they're far less visible. Um, most pixel art of that era looks much better on a CRT. Like if you go and look at Final Fantasy sprites on a CRT versus on hardware, like um, a modern LCD or um, something, it, they look so much better on a CRT. Um, but anyway, they've gone to a lot of effort to, there's a lot of variation in these tiles. There are a lot of different terrain types and they've tried to make things look very organic within the restrictions that they had. Oh, I think it's JPEG -y, DMM. Okay. Rats. Um, so Doing this sort of pixel art is very difficult, um, even with modern tools. Um, we have good pixel art programs, like there's Graphic Scale and a Sprite nowadays, among some others, but they're still not really, like, it's kind of like, it's kind of like code editing. There's really, like, there should be all of these amazing tooling options because it's been 30 years, but nobody's really kind of stepped up to do, like, innovative, crazy stuff yet. Maybe in the future they shall. Um, but for basic editing, um, I would definitely highly recommend a sprite for pixel art. It's just awesome. But anyway, I'm rambling so much. Here's a more modern style pixel art game, um, which is probably for Android phones, if I had to guess. Um, so what this artist has done is they have leaned into the pixel art. Uh, and you see this a lot with sort of present day, quote unquote, retro games, as they will lean into the pixel art and kind of emphasize the fact that it is on a grid and they will emphasize the fact that it's low resolution um, and kind of go for the simplest possible art that they can make um, because it's kind of, I don't, I can't claim to understand what people's thought process is obviously, but I think to some degree, well, <laughs> this is a very touchy subject and I, and I, I love pixel art and I am a pixel artist. so. Please nobody be offended. A lot of indies will do pixel art for their game because it is the most accessible way for a programmer to do the artwork for their game. Um, because pixel art is more mathematical and methodical, I would say, than a lot of other types of artwork. And you can, somebody who does not have a lot of art fundamentals training can make pretty decent looking pixel art um, after a little bit of practice and it's much more accessible than trying to do like, I don't know, like the art style from Braid or something would be very difficult for most programmers. Um, whereas this is a lot more approachable. Um, 
but and there's also this element of kind of nostalgia exploitation where it's like oh look how big the pixels are remember when the pixels were big by my game but um anyway so you can have an art style that like sort of leans heavily into the fact that it is pixel art and kind of um shows off the the squareness of things and that sort of stuff um the the shapes in here the shape language is very boxy right you have these kind of freeform silhouetted trees in the background that don't super fit but everything in the foreground kind of emphasizes the fact that it is square and intentionally does so um, if you look at the way that they highlight things there's always uh, this sort of light border on two sides dark border on two sides to show that it's kind of like a flat tile like a kitchen tile or a bathroom tile sort of shape and even the pipes are somewhat flat looking I would assume intentionally but anyway in a minute, I'm going to have to launch a sprite to talk about another thing. This is so disorganized. I apologize, but I really, 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 really threw this together. Um, I don't know what game this is, but I was looking for some modern uh, pixel art game aesthetics, and this is a great example of, obviously, it's pixel art, and it's, very, it's quite good pixel art, um, for that matter, but... Uh, they've kind of put a lot of effort in to add perspective and depth and to kind of remove the obviousness of the grid, right? So there are repeating elements like the tiles on the sidewalk repeat, um, among other things, but they've put effort in to make it so that everything has a lot of detail and is very cohesive and there aren't a lot of obvious borders. Like the aspect of it where the pixel art shines is just sort of the fact that there are a lot of sort of uniform lines, like there are a lot of straight edges and things of that sort. Um, but none of them are really garish and jarring um, as they would be in an older game. So that's something to think about. Um, here's another modern example. Um, you can tell that things are tile-based, but they are tile-based in a cohesive and nice-feeling way. Um, and having modern uh, hardware means that you can do the same sort of stylistic choices, but you can have a lot more detail and polish on it, right? Um, so you can see they've got kind of transition tiles for the grass, for the the like path and between the path and the grass, um, there's kind of these little uh, scalloped edges, and um, we're going to talk about how you can make those in a little bit. Um, blah blah blah, and then you have sort of individual objects like these buildings and trees are not likely to be part of a tile set. They're um, in StarCraft parlance, they would be doodads. They're sort of singular objects. Um, that are self-contained and not split into tiles. Even if visually they could be tile-based, um, they are most likely individual, like, separate images um, that include the shadow and stuff, and they just plop those in as an entity in whatever engine this is made in. Uh, here's another modern uh, sort of what looks to be a mobile game example. Um, this one also leans into the fact that it's pixel art and kind of there's a lot of uh, straight edges and squareness to things. I like this one a lot better um, because they have leaned into the fact that it's pixel art while also developing a unique style for it. Um, it's very, um, I use the word very too much. It's a unique style while still emphasizing the fact that the chunks, that the, the pixels are chunky, right? Um, there's good color theory in here. There's a lot of variation in here while still sort of drawing your eye to the fact that things are made out of relatively large squares, right? Um, let's see. Here is Enter the Gungeon, uh, which is a roguelite game. If you've not played it, it's pretty fun. I've never actually gotten to any of the final bosses. I don't have enough patience for that. Um, yeah, everything is a gun. If you haven't seen this uh, game, DMM, um, like the enemies are bullets and things, and you can get guns that shoot other guns that shoot bullets and all sorts of. It's okay, cool. <laughs> it's very heavily like inspired by games like Binding of Isaac. I think um, it has some similar um, elements to that. Um, this game is harder to me, but that's maybe just because I haven't played it 
anywhere near as much. Um, the pixel art style in Enter the Gungeon is kind of an interesting hybrid because it leans heavily into the fact that it's pixel art in some respects. Like there's a lot of sort of cell shading and like single pixel lines, like your character's little legs, where they're kind of saying, this is a modern pixel art game. Um, and it makes me think of sort of the art style of games like Fez, where it's very much your attention is super drawn to the fact that it's pixel art. But Enter the Gungeon also has all of these detailed elements and uh, dynamic lighting as well. So like you can see all this little um, like dithering and stuff on the dungeon walls, which is more of a traditional pixel art thing to do. Um, but then they don't shy away from having these big flat areas of color um, to go for a more cell shaded look in certain places. Um, so point being, you can have a lot of different styles <laughs> and you can kind of integrate a lot of different style elements with each other and it can still work. Um, it's just up to you to experiment and figure out what you like and what you want your game to feel like for the player. Um, here's an amazing piece of pixel art that I found. Um, so there's kind of a mixture of great stuff in here. So they, you can tell that the ground tiles are tile-based, which I don't think is a problem, but there's all these little flourishes, like the ledges have their own little unique edges. They're not just flat. The grass hangs over. Um, there are areas of light and dark uh, inside the ground, which are good to have. Um, there's a lot of personality in here, and also like there's you know lighting from the sun on the top and the left, which is this kind of orangey color, and then there's backlighting, um, bounce lighting from the sky on the ground, which is blue, which is super delightful and just it really pops this ground out of the background, even though the background also has bright colors. Um, even though there are bright colors in the background and the foreground, you can still differentiate them because there's this effort put in on shading and lighting to make the ground really stand out to you. Um, yeah, this art style is particularly delicious. I don't know who made this, but it's wonderful. And then you still have these sort of one-off, unique, detailed objects like the trees. There are lots of unique trees in here. Um, and there's a lot of personality in the animations here as well, but we're not talking about animations today. <laughs> um, moving along. Here is a screenshot from Iconoclasts, um, which does uh, kind of a very interesting style where it's still tile-based, as far as I'm aware, but also there are loads of these little like decorative accoutrements around. Um, like you've got little flowers and little flourishes and things. And then you also have these sort of large chunky objects that are much larger than an individual tile, and they really serve to kind of break up what would be a monotonous area of the screen, right? This area that she's in here is kind of a little corridor. And so without these giant objects <laughs> inside the ground, the ground could be very uniform. Um, but instead, it has these big chunky things to kind of add to visual interest to it. Um, so that it's not just flat. Um, this is like, Joachim, whose name I never know if I'm pronouncing right, is a very good pixel artist. And this is something that like, I imagine somebody would have to aspire to, to a long time. Um, this is like advanced pixel art in my opinion, but I wanted to show it as just kind of, we've been going on a spectrum from sort of, here's what we could do on the NES versus here's what people are doing now when there's so much more artistic freedom thanks to hardware advances. Um, here's another example from Iconoclasts. And this one you can see more that the, you can see more the tile-based nature of the ground. Um, and you can see again that there are these big objects. Although in this case, the big objects fade into the background a little bit more. They have a little less contrast. Um, because the focus is on you're in this cave and the surfaces are brightly lit from these sun rays coming in from behind, right? And then the other bits kind of fade into the background in shadow because the focus should be on the center of the screen and like that kind of thing. Uh, what else? Let's see, I'm about half an hour in. Forgato and Friends. This is a classic uh, indie platformer for basically 
every accessible platform. Um, this game taught me OpenGL programming <laughs> when I was a teenager. Um, nowadays, it's too modern C++ for me to read. But anyway, um, this game has phenomenal pixel art. Um, and I wanted to show a screenshot of it as kind of an example of here's where tile sets kind of become indistinguishable from just actual like pixel for pixel pixel art. Um, the amount of detail in this game's artwork is absolutely insane. And they again lean on having these large objects sort of in the foreground as part of the ground tiles and things like that. And in Forgato, you can pick out tiles if you look carefully, but for the most part, if you just glance at this game, you don't see any tile boundaries. You feel them when you play, um, and the game feels very tight anyway. Like Even though you can't see the boundaries, it feels very natural to play, and you get a very quick intuition of what's solid and what isn't. They do an absolutely phenomenal job. So like, if you want to do any studies in like making a tile-based game look and feel like somebody hand-pixeled every level completely from scratch, um, check this game out. It's really, 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 really good. Um, what else we got here? Oh, and then I also have a screenshot of Celeste for kind of, oh, that's a terrible screenshot. It's way too small. Oh my goodness. Well, anyway, uh, Celeste is a wonderful game. Um, and something that I really like about Celeste, it's another game that leans into the fact that it's pixel art. So it's relatively low resolution. The tiles are eight by eight pixels. Um, and they don't shy away from that. Um, there's a lot of detail in Celeste, um, but they kind of, they allow things to be as square as they need to be while still adding little niceties, like little rounded corners and stuff. The, it's a very precision platformer if you haven't played it. And so it's kind of, you need to know exactly where boundaries are. And they do a good job of letting you know exactly where boundaries are without compromising artistic quality. Um, I think it's a very, like they tow the line of sort of cheesy, lazy retro graphics and really excellent retro graphics. Um, they, they, I don't know, I'm bad at describing this, but they do a wonderful job. Um, so that is kind of the end of my half hour diatribe on going through tile set styles in terms of just pixel art. Um, from that, uh, I wanted to briefly talk about um, how resolution and art style influence each other. So when you have, um, so like with the Pokemon example, right? There's very little real estate in terms of pixels that you can use, right? In modern games, you can use pretty much what, as much as you want. Dot Big Bang currently kind of reintroduces some restrictions, right? Um, we don't do anything clever like make a texture out of a flat plane if there's a bunch of noise in it, right? <laughs> so um, having a very detailed texture can add a lot of polygons to your game. Um, so we tend to do somewhat low resolution, chunky things. Um, but when you're talking about tile sets in particular, um, I try to find a good example of this. Like there's a particular example in this actually, if I can find it, uh, Throne. Nope, it's not in here, rats. Uh, this is an article by Lars uh, Duchette who makes um, Defender's Quest. And he's talking about these terrible looking Final Fantasy remakes on mobile um, where they did this. Uh, <laughs> sort of the wrong way to up res. Um, but something I wanted to talk about is when you have very low res pixel art, um, like sort of Game Boy era pixel art, getting a good transition between tiles is a little bit easier because the, the lower resolution something is, the more details the brain fills in for you, if that makes sense. And the higher resolution your pixel art becomes, the more detail you have to put because there's more, you know, there's more mathematical complexity, period. There's more pixels, period. Um, so the eye has more to consume. And so you have to furnish more detail um, because the brain expects it to be there because it's higher resolution. Um, 
let me see. It might have been in part one. Hang on. Sorry if this is making anybody nauseous. This is an excellent article. It's called How to Do... It's called Doing an HD Remake the Right Way. Uh, and it is absolutely correct in about everything. Lars knows what he is doing. Um, rats. I think I wanted part one. Hang on. Uh, uh, yeah, let me drop a link for you. Boop. All right. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Nope. Do, 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 do. It is this article, but ah, right. Here's here's a good example. So in the original game, uh, this pillar looks absolutely fine. If you squint, you might notice that this stone in the pillar is very large, um, but it doesn't it doesn't break cohesion of the artwork, right? If you look in the remake, um, it's a little bit more obvious because there's just this huge texture seam at the bottom of the pillar right here, and it looks really bad. <laughs> um, so adding more detail is not always sort of a free quality increase. Um, yeah, it really is unprofessional. I Yeah, the, reading these posts makes me so angry. Um, so adding more detail is not always your friend. Um, if you're going to go for a higher resolution uh, tile art, you have to be committed to doing more transition tiles, basically, is what it means um, in most situations. Now, you can avoid having to do more transition tiles by having sort of discrete objects like Pokemon has, where one tree is one tile or one tree is four tiles. Um, if you keep things self-contained um, and very boxy, then you don't really have to worry about transitions looking bad. Um, but if you want to kind of blur the grid a little bit, then transitions become very important. And the higher resolution you go, the more effort you have to put into those transitions to some degree. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, I was going to talk about where is my other articles? Where? Oh, okay. I was going to talk about, um, where is it? Well, not this one, but there's another article that is only on the Wayback Machine with no images, which talks about different types of tile transitions called, so there are three sort of classical um, categories. There's the rug, the fence, and the blob. Um, VXAce is pretty good. Um, and this article, when it existed, was pretty good, but they removed it from the blog, and maybe I have a PDF somewhere. But anyway, so uh, the rug is kind of the simplest auto tile you could have. I was going to have an example made in a sprite, but I ran out of time. Um, I can try to poop one out. Uh, sure, why not? And we need a grid. Grid, 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 uh, eight pixels by eight pixels. So uh, this image needs to be larger. OK. So here we have an image, and it is 64 by 64. So let's say that one tile is 16 by 16 pixels like this. So if you want to have. Um, Oh, it was a specific uh, thing, DMM. It was, uh, they had a nice diagram of how the auto tiles work, um, which I was going to talk about when I talk about simplifying <laughs> having complex tile transitions. Um, so the simplest auto tile type is called the rug because the way it works is you have nine tiles. So if we're doing 16 by 16, this rectangle will be nine tiles. And then what you have is you have kind of a, Oopsie, you have sort of, if you have three tiles, right? So then we have three by three. So here is like one corner of the rug, if that makes sense. So you have four corners and then you have four edges and then you have at least one center tile, right? And so you can make any, uh, sort of convex hull <laughs> with this. Um, it's ideally suited for rectangles because there are no interior corners. 
um, if you, uh, that didn't work how I wanted. So there are no exterior, no interior corners here. So if you made a shape like this, so if we wanted to make a rug, right? And so we have our rug here. And then let's say that uh, this bit comes out one more tile, right? Well, then we've got, we've got the top edge tile that we need and we've got the inside tile that we need, but now suddenly we're in trouble, right? Because we can put this corner here, but now what should this tile be? We don't have a tile for this, right? So we put the center tile here and there's this gap. Now in this case, since this is one pixel outline on a blue rectangle, this is actually an okay solution because this looks like a little soft corner to, to us, right? But what if we had a complicated border? Like what if we had a border that was like, uh, what if we had a border that came in a few pixels and like had some detail, like say this was an actual rug or something. Uh, and we had some details in here, like a floral pattern or something. And I'm doing an outline because this is off the cuff with no time. Um, so now we can go and apply this right to our weird shape. And the problem will be somewhat immediately obvious, I think. So now we've got those. And then we've got this, and then we've got that. And we've got another one of these, we've got another one of these. So now you can see the problem, right? <laughs> now it's very obvious that we've just pasted the center tile here, and there should be an interior corner, whoopsie, that looks like this or something, right? There should be an interior corner there that connects these two. And it's very obvious that there isn't one when we've added just the tiniest amount of detail, right? Um, that can be really frustrating. Uh, so what you would generally do instead, oh no, I hit the wrong. What is the hotkey to grab a color in a sprite? I haven't used it in a little while. Um, so you want to have these interior corners. Um, so that complicates your tile set a little bit, right? Suddenly nine tiles, nine complete tiles is not enough. Um, and so this is where those subtiles come back into the picture, right? Uh, where I was talking about like the grass and Pokemon is actually four subtiles or characters. Let's look at the characters that are in here. So we've got, whoopsie. So if we look at subtiles, we've got these two We've got this one, which is just a flip, right? We've got these two, we've got this one, and then we have the three that would go on the bottom. So we have these, we actually have nine subtiles um, that we can compose all of these tiles out of. And then we can also make uh, four more subtiles for these interior corners. Um, and then if we compose our larger tiles out of subtiles, we still don't have to do that much artwork, in fact. Um, and if you ever want to go for a sort of Game Boy Advance, uh, why, didn't I, why didn't I get an example of that? Um, you can, which this game uses a lot of flat color, so maybe not the best example, but Superstar Saga is very good about this sort of thing. Um, there are all these little, see they've got the interior tile, the interior corners, exterior corners for this puffy grass. You can make your larger tiles out of smaller tiles and you get can get this sort of GBA art style where you can tell it's tile based, but there's a lot of flavor and nuance to the tile basedness and it's not bad looking. Um, anyway. So how do we fix this problem? We need these interior tiles, right? Um, so kind of the well-known sort of complex way to do this is to make what's called a blob. Uh, and a blob tile set is very hinky. Um, so this article, so blobs are a form of Wang tiles, which is a mathematical thing that I don't understand as well as I should. Um, I am a very 
pragmatic developer, which is my excuse to not understand things that I use every single day. Uh, and we'll gloss over that. But so the idea of a blob tile set is that it can handle all these sorts of interior corners. It can handle narrow paths that need to have edges. It can handle a single tile, etc. cetera. Um, and when you're looking at it in terms of actual tiles, there are 47 variants that you can have, um, which is quite a few. And when you do the bit mask for that, there are quite a few cases, right? Um, so this is a good article, which I can also share. Um, and this is they sort of, here is every single of those 47 tiles laid out in a contiguous fashion. And this humongous image is the tile set. Um, so this is 47 tiles. That is a lot of tiles. Um, you don't actually need this many though. So they kind of compress it into the minimum, right? And here they are. Uh, and this is still too many, frankly, um, because you only actually need, like you do not need this many, you don't need to do this much artwork. All you actually need is a set of subtiles. If you make your artwork work with subtiles, then you can do what RPG Maker VX Ace does. Auto tiles and RPG Maker XP and VX and VX Ace. Um, this is way more complicated than I recall. Uh, let's see. Here's an okay example. So you can do you can do this with whole tiles, which is what we see on the left version of this. Uh, on the left hand side, we have a whole tile auto tile where we have corners, edges, and a center tile, like I was talking about before. Um, and then you can have variants on the center tiles. What we have on the right is a, a RPG Maker XP style auto tile, which uses sub tiles. Um, so here, these are actually, each of these is actually four sub tiles, right? And so with these 16 sub tiles, plus what is 16 plus eight, 24, with 24 sub tiles, we can make 47 uh, actual, where the heck is it? We can make all 47 of these out of 24 subtiles. Um, and I can provide a code snippet that can help determine that. So the way that, so you, once you have this, you can lay out your maps manually, but having this sort of thing gives you the power to do auto tiling where you just say, here is this terrain and here's this other terrain. And then you can choose which subtiles to use where based on a rule set um, so that you don't have to hand paint all the edges of your grass or whatever. Um, this is a little bit complex probably for what you're doing in Big Bang right now, Lambda, um, but it's something to be aware of in terms of like making transitions look good. So here they have this uh, really interesting example um, where they've made a complex tile set with perspective and stuff, and it still works with these rules very well. Um, having this 47 tile situation is kind of standard. Um, different engines handle it differently. I believe Godot has a auto tile that you can import, and it just has like all 47 in it for some, yeah, here we go. <laughs> here's, here's all of our gazillion billion tiles. Um, which is great for doing really high res pixel art or like painterly art. But if you can get away with subtitles, for the love of God, use subtitles. You will save yourself a lot of time that you probably don't have. Um, anyway, there used to be a really good article about the, this topic of different types of auto tiles, but it is no longer around. Um, I was going to touch on non-rectangular tiles like hex tiles, but we definitely don't have time for that, nor do I have any examples handy for that. Um, so with that, I'm going to take a very quick bathroom break. And when I get back, we can do some programming examples. So I'm going to stop recording and BRB.
Okay, I have returned. <sighs> so, what are we doing? Programming examples, off the cuff programming examples, my favorite. Um, so this is not not Big Bang. <laughs> um, I was trying to throw this together this morning um, before the office hours because I didn't have time to do it yesterday. So, um, so what we're gonna do is we're going to live code and chat about, oh, come on, give me a break. Oh, right, this isn't finished yet. All right, fine. So what we have, can you please, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna talk about storing and uh, displaying tile maps. So I have done the simplest possible thing, which is, uh, I should probably make the text larger for you guys. Uh, I don't know, that feels kind of claustrophobic. Let's see, settings, thank you. Let's get crunk at 20 pixels, that's too big, that's way too big. Uh, 18, perhaps? I'll allow it, okay. So, here is, um, I wanna talk about different things. So. Here's an example of storing tiles in a multi-dimensional array. So we have map height. So we're doing, um, basically we're making a table of rows. So what's some, a caveat to think about here is it's Y then X, <laughs> not X then Y. Uh, and the reason for that is that I want to render from left to right, top to bottom. Uh, and I want to think about or from top to bottom, left to right, sorry. And I want to think about my tiles that way. That's kind of a preference you could do, like whether you do column major or row major is up to you, but I always do it this way with Y first, then X. So we have a multidimensional array. So each entry in the multidimensional array is a row of tiles, right? A horizontal row of tiles. And so I just have zero and one here for the example, so we've got zero is an empty tile, one is a solid tile, and so over here on the output, um, hopefully that looks okay on the capture. Uh, can I just like, oh no, don't give me that crap. Okay, anyway, so we just draw a little box for every solid tile. So the way we do that, um, ignore this stuff basically, so we go f for each, each Y coordinate, each Y tile, right? then each X tile, uh, if the tile is not zero, we're going to draw a box there and it's going to, and then basically what we do for the coordinates is we, we increment X on tile sizes and we increment Y on tile sizes after each row. This does not especially matter for dot big bang because of course you'll probably be instantiating entities, right, for your tiles. Um, but kind of having an idea of how to address an individual tile is important, right? So the ith jth tile, i here is y and j here is x uh, in the map. So like, you know, zero, one, two, three, zero, one, two, three, this would be tile three, three, would be right here. Uh, so the next example I wanted to do is, okay, uh, the index munging thing that I referred to, lambda. Um, so let's say if we have a flat array instead of a multi-dimensional one, that looks like this. Um, so actually, so I've laid this out in a table, but actually it's not one. This is just a flat list, right? This could be here. This could be one long line of numbers. Um, people will often store uh, and the size is map width times map height, obviously. A lot of times people will store tile maps in this way just because you can. I don't remember if it's better for the cache or something, but we don't care about that in JavaScript land. Everything is slow. Um, so to, to address tiles like this, you have to think about uh, where you want to go. So for example, if we wanted a specific tile, like uh, let's say that we want tile uh, x equals three and y equals six, for example, which is going to be a zero. Um, if we want that tile, then what we would do 
uh, is we would have something like this. We would have like uh, tile x equals three, tile y equals six. And so what we want to do now is turn that into a flat index. Um, so we need to figure out which of these it is, right? And so the way we would do that, uh, I posted a snippet the other day. Um, so tile index then would be tile x, which is just a flat number, right? And then to get the y, you just figure out how long a row is and go forward that many rows, right? So in this case, it's like tile y times map width, right? And so that I feel like that should be pretty straightforward. Um, so map width is 10, so you have 10 times 6, so 60 plus 3 is tile 63, right? So you can convert pretty trivially from an x of y coordinate to an index, um, but for the case down here where we're going to draw the map, we want to convert from an index to an x and y coordinate, right? And that is actually not very bad at all. So we don't need this inner loop anymore. We have one loop which is going over all of the tiles. And so then what we'll do is we'll say... Let's see, tile x equals, and we'll have i modulo map width, right? Because if we divide the tile index by the map width, that will tell us the tile y, right? Because we're doing integer division here, right? So this will tell us how many rows we have jumped down, and this will tell us how many are left over after that, which is the x coordinate, right? And um, the interesting thing about that, it's slightly different in TypeScript, right? So we'd have like math floor, i over map width, right? And then here, I don't, I think, hmm. is modulus in TypeScript integral or can it give you a fraction? I don't know. I would probably floor it just to be safe. <laughs> um, anyway, so now we have our tile x and y, and we want to translate that into the actual position that we want, right? So instead of doing this arithmetic, uh, what we would do is we would say x equals tile x times tile width plus start x. Right, or if you want, this might be easier to like conceptualize. We'll put the start x first. So you have our starting position, which is this top left corner, and then we're going to take however many tiles we are, and then we're going to multiply that by the tile size, right? To jump over that many spots. And then we do the same sort of deal with the y. Um, if your tiles were rectangular and not square, you might have a tile width and height there instead. Uh, and so then we're just going to draw our box. All right, I suppose first we should see if we need to even draw this tile. So if tiles I, so if the tile needs to be drawn, then we'll grab all this crap. And we shall go and do that. And we'll draw our box. that should be good to go. So if I go and change which example is active, nothing should change. <laughs> it should be exactly the same unless I've made a goof somewhere. And it's exactly the same. Cool, cool, cool. Excellent. Why is my log scrolled to the wrong place? Whatever. OK. So uh, with that, that's the difference between a multi-dimensional array and a flat array, a one-dimensional array. Um, let's see. The, uh, one other thing I would say is if you're going to store a dense map like this, that is you're storing a value for every single tile, whether there is one or not, um, single dimensional is probably easier in languages like JavaScript and TypeScript um, because and, and Lua and others, because of course you can't just conveniently declare the dimensions of arrays in most dynamic languages um, because they're stupid that way. <laughs> you can't just say, give me a big table of default values. You have to manually build the table, right? So 
you would be pushing all of these values onto the thing in TypeScript. And if you only have, if you want to do it multidimensional, then you've got to make a new array for each row and then push all of the tiles into the row and then push the row into the table, right? Whereas um, it's much easier with a single dimensional array, you can just say, I'm going to push width times height default values of tiles and then my map will automatically be the correct size, right? Um, that's a little bit nicer um, to me, but it is a, a style points thing and not like an actual uh, thing. Let's see. What else is on my list? Uh, okay, did the index munging, did flat versus multiple dimensional. Oh, I want to talk about sparse flat arrays. Uh, so we're going to make a, a new example. Um, so let's say we didn't want to store all of this crap, right? We didn't want to store all of these things that we're not even using. Um, what we would need to do then is we would need to come up with a sparse storage implementation. Now, this is C, so I apologize. <laughs> um, but there is enough similarity to TypeScript uh, in that you know types exist. Um, so you could do something similar, except it would be a class of TypeScript and la-di-da. Um, so we need a way to represent a sparse tile. So if we're not storing every tile, then for every tile we have, we need to know where it is. So the most naive, simple way to do this, and naive is not a value judgment, that's just in programming terms, here's the simplest possible thing without trying to think ahead to problems we'll encounter. Um, so let's make a little type here uh, that we'll call a sparse tile to keep it simple. Uh, let me do it in a more TSE looking. So let's say we have a sparse tile here. Uh, we'll have a position for it, and then we will also have a value for it, um, which could be you know type or whatever. Uh, so we'll have our sparse tile here, and then what we shall do. Call this a sparse array example. Uh, so then some of this stuff will be the same, like tile size will still be 16. Um, and you know what? Let's just, well, hmm. We don't need to care about the map dimensions in this case. You could um, if you wanted to make sure that you didn't place anything outside of boundaries or something, but we don't have to worry about that. Uh, so let's see. Let's say that we have a sparse tile. Uh, we're getting into see things <laughs> and we'll call this tiles uh... okay this is just making an array <laughs> with room for like I don't know let's say 32 things in it pay no attention to the C behind the curtain uh, and we'll have an int that is uh, tiles count and we'll set that to zero uh, and then we'll have max tile equals 32 change this to max tile okay so we have an array that can store 32 tiles um you know what we can just skip this hang on i'll just i'll do something grody for you guys let's uh, make it less c We'll just say that we've got room for 32 of these, and then we will, where is it? And, um, zero memory tiles. Uh, what is it? It's like size of, no, actually, I think I can just do this and be extra lazy. All right, Never mind. So we've got an empty array uh, of tiles. Cool. Are we still compiling? We could not get the DLL hung up. OK, we're good. All right, so we have room for 32 tiles. Uh, so let's say we just have some of these. So we'll say, uh, actually, let me go ahead and just make some of these. So each one has x, y, and a value. So we'll say that this is at 0, 0, and it's a 1. And we'll say that this one is at like, I don't know. Two, three, and it's also a one, and I don't know. 
you could do some enumerations here. So like instead of zeros and ones, it could be like wall, floor, dragon, whatever. <laughs> um, okay, there's there's three. <laughs> that's that's so many. Uh, get rid of that because we no longer need it. Um, actually, well, I don't know. We'll see what happens. There could just be garbage values in here, which would be quite interesting, but we shall see. So we don't need the width and height anymore. We don't need this anymore. We do want these. We'll start at the same place, um, although we no longer have a map width and height. Um, let's just assume that it will be roughly negative five tiles, which is what it was before and just not put anything. We could randomly generate some tiles. You know what, let's randomly generate some tiles. Now we'll do that later. We'll do that after we get this working. Sorry, I keep flip-flopping around. Don't need this either, actually. We just need this and let's see. So we'll go through, <clears throat> we'll go through all of our tiles here. And we'll say uh, sparse tile tile is tile i, and then we'll say if tile value. So if we're going to draw the tile, right? Uh, then we'll say x equals start x plus, and it'll be tile x times tile size, right? And then we'll have y is start y plus tile y times tile size. We don't have to care about doing anything fancy with the indices to look up one of these tiles, right? because um, we don't know what the actual positions are until we go and look at the at the tile in the place. So like if you store a sparse array of tiles and you want to like reconstitute it <laughs> into an actual map, then you would just kind of go through each one of these and you'd probably spawn an entity or something for each tile. And then you would use its tile position to set its actual position to be this, right? To be the actual X and Y. You just multiply it out and it's all Gucci. Let's see, is that all we need? Perhaps it is all we need. So let's see if we're compiling here. And we are. So let's go and change over. I was gonna have a nice thing to like push less than and greater than to change the example. Didn't get to that part before the office hours started. So, oh, there's our three tiles, lovely. Excellent. So we've got our three funky tiles. Let's go and generate some instead. So if we want to go and generate some tiles, it's ironic that the sparse tiles is, is also like way less code. Um, in traditional tile-based games, you don't want sparse tiles. You want dense tiles. Um, but in a 3D game engine, you probably do want sparse tiles if you can get away with it. If you can do the sort of flat color plus accoutrements style of um, tile set design, then you could have like one large floor object that's like a solid color or pattern or whatever, and then you could just stick tiles on top of it where you needed to add flare or to add walls. That might be a good option for you, Lambda, but I don't know for sure. You'll just have to try it out. Uh, so let's generate some tiles here. So we'll say four and We'll go up to all of them that it has, and we'll just generate some tiles. Uh, so we will say tiles i uh, value equals, let's do this. So this should fill in roughly, not equals equals equals. Um, this should fill in roughly a third of the tiles with a solid value, and then we'll say if. If we set the value, then we need to also give it a position. Um, well, I mean, we can do the extra work, who cares? So then we'll say x equals, uh, let's just, we can do mod 10 to make it the same boundaries as the other maps were. Um, there we go. <laughs> so every frame we're generating some random tiles uh, the one thing we could do with that is we could, if we wanted to pick a permanent one, uh, this doesn't exist in TypeScript, this is me doing something gross in C. Um, use my grody macro instead, uh, persist inited equals false, 
and we will have if not imited, then we will do ellipsis like this. Grab that, and then we will say, oh dear. We got that, and then we'll say imited equals true. And we'll make this also persist. And there we go. Now it should only happen once. We should get the same map. Oh, I goofed something. No longer supports default int. Are these not defined? Did I not include my own library? OK, that's not what it was. Missing type specifier. Oh, duh. That should be an int. <laughs> Okay, let's just, is that defined? I don't remember, it is not about this. Aha. Okay, so now we have a static, quote unquote, generated map. We could also have it fill, fill, fill more tiles each time, but this is nothing particularly fancy. Um, but sparse tiles, yippee. Uh, and we don't need any of this initialization either. So that's cool. What else did I want to talk about? We've been here for a little over an hour, but I've got the time. So let's see. Uh, we talked about a sparse flat array. So the next level of nonsense would be an indexable sparse flat array. And I don't know if that's a good term, but what I mean by that is what if you want to have a sparse array that is uh, easy to find the tile you want. Um, so you might have some level of nesting um, to make it like planar or something. So you can kind of, because like here, we just have this flat array of its x, y, and value, and we have to go straight through. So like, let's say we wanted to look for something. Like say we wanted to go check if a particular tile had some value in it. Um, we would have to go like by position we would have to go find a tile with that position if it existed and then check the value and these aren't sorted or anything it's just a random flat array so that could be really obnoxious um to just do a linear brute force search um so even if you didn't want to sort things you would probably want to sort things just saying but if you didn't want to you could at least do sort of a nested structure where you would have a list of things either by y or x coordinate or you could partition it of like the y is less than or greater than some number right um, you could split it into chunks basically even though it's sparse um, so that it would be easier to search through your sparse values um, that said you could probably do something clever with sorting a flat array so you could maybe sort it sort your flat array on the x values of the sparse entries and then subsort it on the y values and then you could write a little binary search that would be you know what this is way outside the scope of what you're going to need to do for your game in that big bang ignore me <laughs> um TypeScript and JavaScript are all about dictionaries. So when you load your sparse things, you can just put them in a dictionary. And then the way you check if a tile is there is to give the dictionary your coordinates and see if you get a tile back. Disregard all of my stupid algorithms crap. Um, what else do we want to talk about? Um, I was going to talk a smidge about um, placement in non-tiled images. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, uh, DMM. Visual representation of tile maps. MWM. Oh, do you mean the um, the clicker game that looks really exciting? I was going to do examples in here of grids. So, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That is actually on my list, <laughs> so I'm going to copy one of these and then comment everything out again. So we want to draw a grid, and then we want to be able to snap things to that grid. And, uh, my goodness. All right. Where are we? Lord, 
this is such a disorganized file at this point. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and comment this all out. All right, uh, and so we'll call this grid stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna make the tiles bigger. I'm going to make them 32 pixels so it's more visible. Uh, so let's go and draw a grid real quick so we can then do things with the grid, right? Um, so let's see. Uh, uh, we'll start at, actually, I sure wish I conveniently knew what the bounds of the viewport are, but that is not written in this example. So let's just start at hopefully somewhere reasonably somewhere and then we'll have index oh that's a pun uh, but anyway so we're gonna make this little rectangle uh, of where we're going to draw the grid um, normally you would like go on the viewport and just like fill the screen right but whatever off the cuff super fun yippee uh, so we'll do we'll have an X start X y is start y and then we'll have an i is going to be zero and we'll have let's see hmm how do we want to do this so what we want to do is we want to say four and let's see i we're going to start at zero and we want to figure out how many lines we need to do for our grid so we'll do end x minus start x and we will divide that by our tile size and then we will add one to be safe because uh, if you think about it like let's say that we had a moving camera and the edge of the screen was not directly on a tile boundary um, then we would need to draw one more tile than the screen is wide, if that makes sense. So I'm just going to go ahead and put the plus one there. A lot of this stuff is just like ingrained crap from making too many of these things. Uh, and I need to remember to talk about why I'm doing the silly thing. Uh, let's see. So let's say we're going to draw some lines here. And whoopsie. We want our color to be bright magenta. Okay, cool. So let's say we're going to draw some lines. So we'll do, and we're going to do i times, so for the x, it's going to be i times the tile size, if we're like moving across horizontally, right? So we're, we're drawing vertical lines right now. Uh, so that will be that. And then the Y will be start Y. Whoa, I can't type. Start Y. And then we'll give it another one, which is going to be end Y. Whoopsie. Let's see where we're at so far. Probably errors. Yeah, I know it's not used. Sheesh. Aggressive warnings, very, very, very aggressive warnings here. Which normally I like to program with aggressive warning, but maybe I should have turned it down a little bit before office hours. Yes, I know it, it is used. I use it right there. Oh, what are you talking about? Oh, I went too far. Voila, vertical lines. Let's make this a wider area. <laughs> Oh, doy, I'm not adding the start x, that's what the problem is there. So start x plus, okay. Okay, that should be a little bit better. There we go, a nice little grid, okay. And then we want to do our horizontal lines real quick. So this will be end y minus start y. And that'll be 
be start x, and this one will be end x. And we can do the whole thing start y, and start y plus i times tau sus. All right, there's a grid. Yippee. Okay. So now we have a simple grid. And so what I would like to do is snap the mouse to whichever tile it is in. Uh, trying to remember what my function for getting the mouse coordinates is, because that's where I am as a person. Um, hmm. I don't want to launch my personal Chrome to pull up the documentation because that has lots and lots and lots of YouTube tabs in it. Um, let's see. <laughs> what is the function that I want? Get mouse position. This is what we want. Okay. So. Get mouse position, and this is going to be G platform window. All right. Only trouble there, I believe, is that the mouse position is not going to be. Um, it's not going to be quite right. It's going to be whatever the global is. I believe I need to like scale it. Um, let's see. Spam time. Yeah. yeah, those are pretty bad. Okay, I think that's actually, those are the coordinates on the monitor, which is pretty hilarious. Okay, I need to turn this off before it blows up the shit stupid code. Okay, so that did not work. Please, please, please. Oh my god. Turn it off. Okay. Can I get, I can get the position. Okay, cool. So here's what we're going to do. So we're going to get the window position. And then we're going to do the mouse, and we're going to adjust it by the window position. Sorry, this is like semi irrelevant. I was not as prepared as I wanted to be for this today. I really had to poop something out. Um, okay, so I could, I could switch. Oh dear, I didn't do that. I go all the way up here, is that zero, zero? Oh, interesting. Anyway, <coughs> sorry. I have not done an actual mouse-based thing with this recently, so I have not bothered to do anything intelligent with the mouse position. Um, well, we can kind of play it by ear and try to get something useful here. Uh, another thing, actually, tell you what. First, let's turn this off. First thing I want to do is show the center point of every tile because that's also a placement thing that is relevant. And then after that, after that, I will go and figure out the mouse because it's mostly me goofing around and might not be that illustrative before I run out of time. Um, so what we'll do is we'll do this. first of all, so like that. And this time I'm going to do a nested loop since I'm going sort of uh, tile by tile, if you will. And so I'm going to change these eyes to J's. And we'll do 
to i times or it'd be start x plus i times tau sines plus tau size over two. And that should give us a point in the middle. We gotta do this for x and y, of course. So for y, it's going to look more like start y plus j. Okay, Let's see how that goes. There we go. And we're getting an extra tile, lovely. But anyway, so there's the center points of all the tiles. And after that, let's go. And so what we would like to do is wherever the mouse is, we want to snap it to the nearest like center point, right? So let's uncomment some of our mouse shenanigans. And we're gonna change to a different color here. Uh, what is that yellow? That's probably a bad choice. Let's do light blue and green is yellow. I don't know, I give up. Uh, chill begin, points once again. Okay, and then in here what we are going to do is we're just going to give it mouse coordinates and see where they end up. They're going to be in totally the wrong place. To yeah, totally the wrong place. So now our trick is to figure out where they belong and the Y and X are invert. The Y is inverted, which is interesting. Ay ay ay. Okay. So one thing I'm going to do is uh, I need to also subtract the um, because our coordinate system isn't zero to whatever, it's centered on this window, so we need to subtract the like, we need to subtract the top left corner, which I thought I was doing. Um, minus equals, what do we set our thing to? Uh, let's see if we can just change our coordinate system actually. So what I'll do in here is I'll say, geoload identity, let's see what that gets us. Okay, not the place I would want. Um, uh, is that stuff stored anywhere that I can access it? I don't think it is currently. No, of course not. Why would it be? Ay, ay, ay. Well, what if I grab these? Okay, I'm going to make these globals. Don't do this at home, it's terrible. So I'm just going to pull these out and make these globals like a jerk because I need them for the moment. Ugh. Okay, so so what if we screw the window? Well, we still need a window position actually, don't we? Because because we. Uh, how to make mouse game. All right, let's see, mouse. Wait, I don't need to comment those, what am I doing? I'm losing steam, if you can't tell. Uh, Mouse.y times equals negative one. What does that do for us? What have I done? Uh, right. Do I have this C extension? We shall find out. Probably not, because I'm very strict. Yeah, okay. That's a different thing. Uh, oh, doy. Do, 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 do. What do we get? Not what we wanted. What do we get now? Closer to what we wanted. Okay. <laughs> this out for now because I'm curious. Oh, would you? Ay, ay, ay. So there's that. What else are we doing? Minus one x minus equals. Is that what I want? I don't know if that's what I want. It is not what I want. to 
does it have? You're not going to tell me. Okay. Okay, left, top, right, bottom. Right. <laughs> Followed your channel. Today on Penny Complains About Various Things. Okay, this is still way off. Why is it so far off? I don't understand. Hmm. Well, this is somewhat annoying, but if we want to go ahead and quantize the mouse, even though it's in the wrong place, we can do that. All you have to do is you divide by the tile size. You have to do an integer division. Um, so in TypeScript, this is like math floor, right? X over tile size. But what that will do is give you the, um, what that will do is it will give you the tile x, right? And so then you multiply that by the tile size to send you to the specific tile. And it's the top left corner of the specific tile, right? So you can see it jumping. I don't know if that's big enough for you guys to see it jumping, but it is jumping. I'll make a little rectangle for the, um, for this. So we'll say tile x is mouse.x over tile size. And we'll say, oopsie, tile y is mouse y over tile size. And then we'll say, and then we'll say mouse x is going to be, well, do the actual, hmm, we'll just call it x. <laughs> it's going to be tile x times tile size. Y times tile size, and then we'll say draw box x y tile size tile size, and we'll get rid of this crap. And we shall build. Okay, so now the coordinates are wrong, but you can see that I'm moving tile by tile and snapping to the tile boundaries as I move the mouse, right? And that rectangle is the whole tile because it's snapping the mouse coordinate to the top left of the tile. But if I wanted to draw like at the center, like let's say I wanted to draw a littler box at the center, we can totally do that. Uh, and the way you do that is you do X plus tile size over two. Super simple. And all this stuff works basically the same in, uh, like if you wanted to do this with a 3D map, it's basically the same thing. All this stuff is basically the same. So there's a little tiny box. Oh, that needs to be minus two because we're centering it, right? The box is four by four. We want to center it, so we move the top left corner back. There you go. So there's a little tiny box inside the box, and you'll see that it snaps to the center of the tile as the big box snaps to the origin of the tile at the top left. Yippee. Um, I really wish the mouse coordinates were correct. That's something I will have to look at later after work and figure out what the heck is going on. Um, I was going to touch a tiny bit on... Um, procedural generation of dungeons and stuff, but I am definitely out of time for that. I need to go make breakfast. Um, <laughs> but I was going to talk about herringbone tiles, which is a really cool method uh, that Sean Barrett devised to generate sort of convincing little dungeons in a very computationally cheap and interesting way. 
There are loads of ways to generate dungeons, however. Um, if I find any particularly good blog posts, I don't know if the ones I read back in the day are still around, I will try to link them here. Um, and if anybody has any further questions, um, feel free to ask me in CIP social or something, or CIP scripting or whatever. I will try to answer those. Um, anything else before I go, DMM, since you're here? Okay, cool. All right, well, with that, I will see you all later. Um, I'm going to go cut my bathroom break out of this and try to get it uploaded um, to Google Drive, and then later Charles will have to upload it to our actual channel. Um, but I'll try to get it available for you guys as soon as possible. Thanks for hanging out, and thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.